Hi everyone. In this video, I'm going to take you step by step through everything you need to do and everything you need to know to get the perfect filter tune on any Betaflight quad. I know it's an ambitious goal, so let's not waste any time. While getting a perfect filter tune is going to make a big difference to almost any quadcopter in how it flies and how it feels in the air, it's obviously not everything that you need to do to get your perfect tune. You also need to think about PIDs and rates, and I'm planning to do some future videos covering that. But in this video, we're going to be focusing on the first three steps of this tuning process. Checking the mechanicals, flying the quad on stock filters and PIDs to get some logs to analyze, and then using those logs to set the filters right the first time every time. Now, before we can start tuning a quad, we have to do some mechanical checks to make sure that the quad is in a good state to be tuned. So firstly, check all your screws, make sure none of them are loose. Um, you can use some thread lock or you can use some mechanical damping grease to stop them from backing out. And make sure that none of your screws are over tightened because over tightening a screw is just as bad as under tightening it. Make sure there are no wires running across the top of the flight controller, especially near the gyro. Um, if they touch on the gyro or even touch close to the gyro, it can create a lot of noise and totally throw off your tune. Make sure your ESC has a capacitor fitted to it on the battery leads. This is really mandatory for 6S. I run a 1000 microfarad 35 volt capacitor on 6S and it's also highly recommended for 4S as well. If you bought a good quality ESC, it probably came with a capacitor. Um, use that one, make sure it's fitted. Make sure that you have bi-directional D-shot set up and working on your quad with 0% errors because this entire tuning guide is going to assume that you have RPM filters up and running. Make sure your props are in the state you would normally expect to fly with. So if you commonly fly with props that are a little bit bent, make sure you have some uh, slightly bent props on your quad. Make sure your VTX antenna is mounted securely and cannot wobble back and forth. So if you have a TPU mount, like the one shown in this image, that's really not, not ideal um, because that antenna is actually able to flex and wobble back and forth a little bit. A stubby is much better if that's an option. Or alternatively, if you want to use a longer antenna, make sure it's either mounted into a, a PLA 3D print or a, a PETG or something a bit stiffer, or that it's securely cable tied to standoffs or carbon and can't wobble around in flight creating vibration. If you want to see more on that, my review of the iFlight XL5 uh, is a bit of a, an expose on the problems that you can encounter with VTX antenna mounting. I'll put a link for that down in the video description. Also, it goes without saying, just make sure your motors are reasonably smooth. Um, you know, we can't all have brand new motors on every build, but uh, if you've got any with really, really nasty bearings, uh, consider replacing them. With the mechanical checks out of the way, we can move on to step two, and that is to fly the quad on default beta flight filters and default beta flight PIDs and take some logs. We want to do a tuning flight, so a particular type of flight that contains a few full stick 360 degree snap rolls, a few full stick 360 degree snap flips, and some 360 degree snap yaw spins. And then we also want to do some gradual throttle ramps from zero to full throttle over about three seconds. And you want to do maybe three to five of each of those maneuvers. And that's all you really want to do in the flight. That's all you need to do. Listen to the motors while you're doing this tuning flight. On beta flight defaults, default filters, default PIDs, the motors should really sound completely smooth. If they sound at all rough, that points to a potential mechanical issue. So consider going back to step one, unless you're flying a huge quad with enormous props, um, then you might need to start off with even more aggressive filtering than defaults in order to get a nice smooth tuning flight. But for everyone flying 
three inch, four inch, five inch, six inch, seven inch quads, you should have a nice smooth experience on Betaflight default filters and PIDs. And if you don't, go back and check your mechanicals, go back to step one. Before you do your flight, you need to set up logging so that you can record what the quad is doing and then look at that information later to help you set up your filters. If you don't know how to set up logging, don't worry because we're going to do that now. So I'm going to show you now how to set up black box logging in Betaflight and I'm also going to show you the exact black box settings that you need to set so that later when you look at the logs you've got all the information you need to do the right filter tune for you. So I'm going to come up here select the right COM port for the flight controller that I've got plugged into my computer and I'm going to connect. Then I'm going to go over to this left hand list and go down to black box. Now in the black box logging device here you should see onboard flash or SD card. One or other of those is going to be fine. If you are using SD card logging, make sure that you have a correctly formatted SD card in your flight controller's SD card slot. For the black box logging rate, we want to set it to 2 kilohertz. And for the black box debug mode, we want to set it to gyro underscore scaled. Now, if we come down here, I have an onboard data flash chip here but I'm just checking that there's some free space and that everything looks good here. Um, if you've got any big red bars or any errors, that might indicate a problem with your SD card. If you're using SD card logging, you might need to reformat it or something like that. If, you, if this is completely full, all orange, and you have no free space left on your onboard data flash chip, uh, you may need to click this button to erase it to make yourself some space for the logs you're about to take. If you're happy with all of that, you can hit save and reboot. And that's all you need to do. Now, what will help you to get the best possible filter tune for your quad is if you understand really well the theory behind the filters that Betaflight uses to process the raw gyro data before passing it on to the PID loop. If you understand what those filters do and how they work, that's going to put you in a much better position to get that perfect filter tune for your quad. And actually, for filtering in Betaflight, it's not too difficult. There are only two types of filters. The first type is a low pass filter, and the second type is a notch filter. And all the filters in Betaflight are either low pass filters or notch filters. So if you understand both of those types of filters, you understand everything about Betaflight filtering. A low pass filter attenuates high frequencies. And we can see what that means by looking at this graph here. At low frequencies on the left side, you can see that the low pass filter doesn't reduce the amplitude of those vibrations at all. They come through at their full size. As you approach the cutoff frequency, you can see that the low pass filter starts reducing the amplitude or the size of those vibrations. And at the cutoff frequency, that reduction is three decibels or 50%. So it's reducing the vibrations to half their size at the cutoff frequency. As we go past the cutoff frequency to higher and higher frequencies, you can see that that reduction, that attenuation just increases. And at very high frequencies, the low pass filter really doesn't allow any of that vibration, any of that noise to pass through into the PID loop. Now, Betaflight offers us two different types of low pass filter. The first is the PT1. That's a simple single pole filter. It has less phase delay than other types of filter, but it also provides less filtering. And what I mean by that is it has a shallower gradient at the cutoff frequency. So it's not a nice sharp cutoff from the filter. It's more of a shallow gradient. So it does let more high frequency noise through um, than other types of filters. The other type offered by Betaflight is the biquad filter, which is a double pole filter. And because it's a double pole filter, it offers a much sharper cutoff. So it's a much steeper gradient of this curve around the cutoff frequency. So it attenuates frequencies higher than the cutoff frequency more aggressively than um, the PT1. And it attenuates frequencies lower than the cutoff 
less aggressively than a PT1. And that's a, that's a good thing. But you pay for that by um, the fact that the bipod has more delay than the PT1. The second class of filter in Betaflight is the notch filter. Now, a notch filter attenuates vibrations or noise around a particular frequency, a target frequency. And it delivers enormous attenuation, enormous reduction at its target frequency and less on either side. So you can see here at frequencies much lower than the target frequency of the notch. There's no reduction in the noise. It comes through at its full size. As you start approaching the target frequency, the attenuation starts happening. And at the lower cutoff frequency, you get a 50% reduction. And then at the target frequency, you get this enormous, enormous reduction. It's, it's a huge, huge effect. You'll almost get no vibrations getting through the notch filter at the, at the notch filter's target frequency. And that's what makes them so good for certain applications. As that frequency starts increasing again and we're moving away from the target frequency, you can see the attenuation, the reduction in the noise is lessening. And then at frequencies much higher than the target frequency, you can see there's no reduction. The vibrations, the noise are coming through at their full size. Now with notch filters, the lower the target frequency and the wider you want to make the notch, the greater the phase delay that must be introduced to do the filtering. So you've heard me talk about filtering delay and phase delay. They're the same thing. All filters introduce delay. And this delay is the time between the gyro detecting the movement of the quad for the first time and that signal being passed through the filters and reaching the PID loop so that the flight controller can take action based on that detected movement. This delay is a mathematical requirement of the filtering. And so it's nothing to do with the processing speed of the flight controller or anything like that. It's just to do with the amount of filtering that you're applying to the signal. The more filtering you apply, the more delay you end up having. And there's nothing you can do about that. If you want more filtering, you must introduce more delay. Now, the way this delay works, I've got this diagram here. You can see that there's a gyro signal here that's got some noise on it, some oscillation, some vibration. And you can see that we have a filtered signal where that vibration, that oscillation is smaller. So you can see that we've done some filtering. We've reduced the size of that vibration. But can you also see that we've delayed the signal by this amount here? So the filtered gyro signal is arriving after the unfiltered gyro was, was received. And that delay is the phase delay of the filter that's being applied to this signal. Now, filter delay damages the performance of the quadcopter in a number of ways, but the, the primary way that I think that we're all aware of is in prop wash scenarios. So when your quad is falling through prop wash and is being buffeted by the turbulence from the wake from its own props, um, the gyro and the PID loop and the flight controller all have to respond very quickly to changing movement of the quad. And any delay that's being introduced by your filtering makes it that much harder for the flight controller to respond and control the movement of the quad. So the key is less is more when it comes to phase delay. And actually less is more when it comes to filtering. The goal with filtering is to have as little filtering as possible without getting oscillations, um, rough sounding motors, hot motors, all of those kind of things. So the aim is always to find that sweet spot where we have the least amount of filtering, but the quad still flies really, really well. Now, some of you might have heard of the term dynamic filters. And in Betaflight, there are dynamic low pass filters and dynamic notch filters, and it can all seem a bit confusing. But just remember that these filters work just exactly the same as the filters that we have already described. It's simply that their cutoff frequencies move around during the flight. So the dynamic low pass filters 
their cutoff frequencies move just based on your throttle position. The dynamic notch filters is a little bit cleverer. It actually moves around to track the peak noise frequencies that uh, are in the gyro signal. So it's trying to target those noise frequencies and remove them. And the RPM notch filters, they move based on the motor RPMs that are reported by the ESCs. So don't get confused by dynamic filters. They're just the same as low pass and notch filters. It's just that their cutoff frequencies don't always stay the same. They move around depending on these different things. All right, so now you know the theory behind the different beta flight filters. We can look at the beta flight filter settings tab and see how you set all these filters up. So let's start here. This is the dynamic gyro low pass filter one. So what this means is it's a dynamic low pass filter. So it's attenuating higher frequencies and it's moving around, it's dynamic and it's moving based on throttle position. And this minimum cutoff frequency here, 200, that's gonna be the cutoff frequency at minimum throttle. And 500 is gonna be the cutoff frequency at maximum throttle. And between that, it's just a linear scale. You can also see the dynamic filter type. You can see it's set to PT1, so it's um, a less aggressive filter. Below that, there's a static version of the gyro low pass filter. So if you didn't want the gyro low pass filter to move around with throttle position, you could turn the dynamic filter off and turn the static filter on and just set one cutoff frequency and the type. And then it wouldn't move. It would just stay at that frequency all the time. And there's also a second static gyro low pass filter. And that works just the same as the static filter above it. You set the cutoff frequency here, 200 Hertz is the default and the type again, PT1. So it's a less aggressive filter. If we come down here, we see some gyro notch filters and these are static gyro notch filters. So um, they don't move around with anything. They just stay in one place. But with the dynamic notch filter, you really don't need to use any static notches in my opinion. But if you wanted to set up some static notches, you could do them here by turning them on and setting the center frequency and the cutoff frequency. So the center frequency is like the target frequency where you get maximum attenuation. And the cutoff frequency is that uh, the frequency where you get 50% attenuation. So here at the RPM filter, we have the harmonics number. Now this says how many multiples of the motor frequency you also want to apply notch filters on. I would leave this to three, that's a, that's a good number. And that means that you're gonna be targeting a notch on the motor frequency and twice the motor frequency and three times the motor frequency. And that's a, that's a good thing to do. The second number is the gyro RPM filter minimum frequency. And that simply says, how far down are the RPM notches allowed to go? Because we don't want them coming all the way down to zero because if they come down too low in frequency, they'll start introducing enormous amounts of delay and that would be, that would be really bad. So uh, 100 Hertz is a pretty, good, a pretty good value for that for most quads. And then here we have the dynamic notch filter. So this is a notch filter that moves around and targets the frequencies where it detects there is the most noise. So you can set the width of the dynamic notch, the Q, which is a measure of the sharpness of the notch. It's kind of like the, a little bit like the cutoff frequency, but um, Q is just a, a measure of sharpness. And then you can set the range that the dynamic notch scans over. So here it will scan down to 70 Hertz and scan up to 350 Hertz, and it's gonna ignore anything below 70 and above 350. If we come over to the D-term filters here, it's very similar to the gyro, but this is extra filtering applied to just the D-term. And again, we have a dynamic low pass filter. So again, that moves around with throttle position, just like the gyro low pass, you have a minimum um, frequency, which will be what you get when you're at zero throttle and a maximum frequency, which will be what you get when you're at maximum throttle and a filter type. This type is PT1. 
but there's options obviously. You then have the static filter number one. If you want to use a static filter instead of the dynamic filter, you don't want it to move around. And that would be set to 150 hertz and a PT1. And then you have a second static filter, static low pass filter, again with a cutoff frequency of 150 hertz and it's a PT1 again. We also have a D-term notch filter, just one here. You can set the center frequency, the frequency of maximum attenuation or maximum reduction, and the cutoff frequency, which is a measure of the, the width. And then here you have a your low pass filter, um, which is again, it's just a PT1 filter with a cutoff frequency of, of 70 Hertz. So hopefully now you understand what all these settings do and how to control all of the filters that um, are active in Betaflight. Okay, so for this next bit, you're gonna to need to look at the log that you've taken from your tuning flight. So I'm gonna show you how to do that now. We've got the quad plugged into the computer again. We're gonna to connect to it. We're gonna go down this left-hand side to black box. We're gonna go down and we're gonna click activate mass storage device mode. Then beta flight will disconnect, that's fine. And then we go to our computer and we open the beta flight onboard flash. And you can see we have a log there, BTFL001. We're gonna double click on that. And if we've got Black Box Explorer installed, which um, you can get, I'll put a link for how to install that in the video description, then Black Box Explorer should open. And after a few seconds, it will load the log. And what we want to do is we want to look at the gyro scaled logs. So if we go down the, the side here, you should see debug mode gyro scaled. And click that, we'll get this kind of spectrograph. And then we have this kind of spectrograph, which is just looking at the frequency. And then if we go up in the top left, we also have the frequency versus throttle, which is a waterfall plot that shows um, where the noise is versus the throttle position. So that's how you can look at the logs. And um, now we'll go and see what those logs mean. Now, what you'll want to do is you'll want to make sure that you check all three axes. So we're looking at roll now. We can click there to look at pitch and we can click there to look at your. And you might want to use this slider up here to kind of increase the gain on the plot so that you can see the noise more clearly. Make sure you check all three axes. And now we're going to go back and look at what that means. So now that we know how to set up the filters and how to control them in Betaflight, we have to ask what is each filter best at? What should we be using each type of filter for? Now, if you look at a waterfall plot here, you can see there's this bright band that kind of sweeps up and a, a second band just about here in the gyro scaled log. And this is motor noise. So it's it's noise directly due to the spinning of the motors. And the RPM filter is best at dealing with motor noise because the RPM filter knows exactly what frequency the motor is rotating at, how many RPMs it's doing, and therefore it knows exactly what frequency of vibration each motor is creating and can really exactly target those frequencies with a notch filter. So the RPM filter is by far the best filter for dealing with motor noise, and that's what we should use it for. If we look here, if you see a vertical stripe like this, so that the motor, motor noise isn't vertical, it kind of sweeps upwards on the waterfall plot. But if you see a vertical stripe like this, that is a frame resonance. And if we look here, you can see that we have some of this vibration at this particular frequency, even when the motor frequency is different. So we can't use the RPM filter to cope with frame resonances. That is what the dynamic notch filter is best at, because the dynamic notch filter will lock on to that frame resonance frequency and put a notch right on top of it. So we want to be using the dynamic notch filter 
to deal with our frame resonances. And so what about the low pass filters on the gyro? What do they deal with? Well, they deal with noise in this region, but as you can see, there really isn't much noise in this region. And that's because on a well-built clean quad, there really isn't much high frequency noise that's not motor noise or frame resonances. And so you simply don't need gyro low pass filters. You can just turn them off because they're not doing anything to help you. And of course, every filter that we can switch off saves us phase delay, reduces phase delay, makes the quad respond more quickly and more accurately to all of the different um, perturbations that it's experiencing in flight. Now, what about the D-term? How do we handle the D-term? Now, the D-term is a bit tricky because the nature of a derivative function, which is what the D-term is, is that it amplifies higher frequency movements. And the higher the frequency, the more amplification that, that happens. And that means that if we don't apply any filtering, the high frequency noise will just be amplified so much that it will just completely overwhelm the PID loop and you'll get oscillations, hop motors, flyaways, all kinds of horrible things. So we absolutely need a low pass filter on the D term to counteract its natural tendency to amplify higher frequency noise. And what we might find is that once we disable low pass filters on the gyro, we actually get a bit more high frequency noise coming through to the D term than we were before. And so we need to apply a little bit more low path filtering to the D term. And in general, this approach reduces the total phase delay because you often don't need to add quite as much extra filtering on the D term as you manage to save taking off the gyro filters. And it improves the quality of the, of the filtering that you're doing because you're filtering exactly where it's needed. So we know we need a low pass filter on the D term, but what type of low pass filter would be best and how should we apply it? Now, in my experience, if you're using RPM filtering and you should be, the D term noise often takes the form of vertical stripes. We can see one here, it's kind of a vertical white band. These are typically caused by resonances in the frame. If your noise shows up as vertical stripes in this waterfall plot, you should use a static filter, not a dynamic filter, because your noise frequency isn't changing with throttle position, so your filter shouldn't change with throttle position either. If, however, you have a sweep of noise that varies with throttle position, you might consider using a dynamic filter because if your noise frequency changes with throttle position, then your filter should also change with throttle position. And that's a good rule of thumb to remember. In my experience, because I typically see with RPM filters on a vertical stripe of noise from frame resonance, I find a single static 100 hertz biquad filter is a good start for clean builds. And if I'm getting oscillations or warm motors or anything like that, I might shift it down to 90 or 80 hertz. And if I'm getting a very clean flight and my motors are staying cool, I might consider increasing it to, you know, 105, 110, 120 hertz, something like that. If you're using a static biquad filter, please don't lower the cutoff frequency below 70 hertz for most builds. Um, a five inch build, don't lower it below 70 hertz because that is going to give you too much phase delay and you're going to uh, end up harming your flight performance. If you seem to need more filtering, uh, a lower cutoff frequency than 70 hertz, I would suggest going back and checking your mechanicals again, go back to step one, because that means you've got a quad that's much noisier than perhaps it should be. So now I'd like to share with you my settings for clean builds. And you'll see that we're applying all of the theory and all of the knowledge that we've talked about in the video so far. So 
we're not using any gyro low pass filters because we have RPM filters and we have dynamic notch filters and they're taking care of nearly all our noise. We don't have any high frequency noise left to worry about. So we're not using any gyro low pass filters. They are all off. We're not using any gyro notch filters because we have the dynamic notch and we're confident that dynamic notch is going to move and target those critical frequencies of interest. We have our RPM filters on with a minimum frequency of 100 hertz and we are targeting three harmonics. RPM filters are super important. This tuning, this filter tuning does not work without RPM filters. We have the dynamic notch filter on. We have it set to be quite narrow and quite sharp to minimize its phase delay. And we are letting it roam over the frequencies where the troublesome frame resonances normally occur for five inch quads. So that's between 100 and 400 hertz. If we come over to the D term, we have a static D term low pass filter. It's a bi quad type because the D term really needs a lot of low pass filtering to, uh, to counteract its tendency to amplify high frequency noise. And we have the cutoff set to 100 hertz, which is a good place to start for most five inch quads. And we have no notches on the D term. They're honestly not really needed if you've got RPM filters and dynamic notch switched on. And we don't have any your low pass filters because typically um, your axes on clean builds are, are very uh, low noise anyway. We don't need any filtering there. So this is a good starting point for clean builds. Some of you who looked at my filter settings for my flight footage video for the AOS 5 reached out to me to ask about the dynamic notch filter because I normally recommend dynamic notch on, but for that frame, I actually have dynamic notch switched off. And the reason for that is that the AOS 5 has been really carefully designed to minimize frame resonances. And with that design and mechanical damping grease applied to the frame, I have been able to get to a stage where frame resonances have been reduced enough that I no longer need a dynamic notch filter on that build. And you can see in the graph on this slide that really there are no visible frame resonances. The only noise that you can see in that graph is just pure motor noise. And that's really well handled by the RPM filters. If you fly an AOS 5, you can also try turning off the dynamic notch filter to get the minimum possible filtering delay and therefore the best prop wash handling and the best flight feel. But unfortunately, I cannot recommend that people try this for other builds because all the other frames that I've looked at have significant frame resonances at frequencies that could be really problematic if they're not handled by the dynamic notch. Even if you are flying an AOS 5, please go carefully as you turn off the dynamic notch filter, check your motor temperatures um, because it's a very aggressive filtering setup. If you're interested to learn more about the AOS 5, I'll put a link down in the video description. I hope that you now feel like you have a fuller understanding of the theory behind gyro filtering in Betaflight and feel able to look at a gyro scale black box log to work out what filtering is best for your build. If you still have questions, please leave them in the comments section down below. I'll try and answer as many as I can. I'd also really appreciate it if other experienced pilots would pitch in and answer a couple of questions so we can all develop our understanding of filter tuning together. That's all I have for you for today. So until next time, I wish you all very, very happy flying.